you can take a seat. Now, I don't know if you've ever done one of these before, but have you ever done one of these before? Okay, well, it's pretty straightforward. I just show you some photographs, and if you see the guilty party, you just tell me who it was, okay? All right, I want you to take a look at these and tell me who actually ruined the Borg. Well, maybe it would help if we talked through each one. Yeah? Okay. Let's start with this one. Now, you might be saying to yourself, it has to be one of the other two, right? Next Generation is where the Borg were introduced. Q Who, Best of Both Worlds, those are great episodes. But if you blow that rose-colored fog off your brain, you might realize that there were a couple of Borg episodes of TNG that made you go WTF. Remember I, Borg? Sure you do. Good episode. Very clever, the way they were able to bring the Borg back after Best of Both Worlds without having to diminish the threat they posed. Sure, Hugh, the stranded Borg, the Enterprise crew befriends, ends up being a pretty sympathetic character, but the Borg collective itself remains fearsome and intimidating, so much so that Picard and company go out of their way to avoid direct conflict with a Borg cube. But what about the Borg's next appearance on TNG? The Descent two-parter that bridges seasons 6 and 7. We meet a clan of Borg drones that have been cut off from the Collective after becoming infected with individuality thanks to Hugh. Lost and confused, this group of Borg is taken over by Data's evil twin Lore, who turns them into a kind of cult to aid him in his plot to... seduce Data to the dark side? improve the Borg with positronic brain implants, and then use them to destroy the Federation? Maybe? What was Lore trying to accomplish anyway? Whatever, that's not the point. The point is, Descent is the first time we see the Borg being presented not as a nigh unbeatable existential threat, but as typical villains of the weak to be outwitted by our heroes. Sure, these Borg aren't THE Borg per se, they're an isolated group, and it's explained why they're different from the Borg we've seen previously, but the fact remains, the crew of the Enterprise encounters the Borg, and they defeat them, and this time, it's really not that big of a deal. You buying that? Okay then, we have two more suspects to consider. Let's take a look at this one. Star Trek First Contact. Good movie. Most would agree it's the best of the Next Generation movies, maybe one of the best of all the Star Trek movies. But let's think about how it treated the Borg. Starts out, Picard's having nightmares about the Borg, flashing back to being assimilated. Seems a little sudden. He hadn't really been bothered about it for a while. Remember after it happened, he went home to France, drank some wine, mud-wrestled his brother, and he was good. Encountered Borg a couple more times, no panic attacks, no nightmares, no voices in his head. But whatever, it's a movie, just go with it. The Borg are shown to be evil badasses. One cube is on its way to Earth, Starfleet is attacking with everything they've got, but they don't seem to be making much of a dent until the Enterprise shows up and Picard, calling on some secret Borg knowledge he remembers from when he was Lacutus, I guess, tells everyone where to shoot. Then they blow the cube up real quick like. Hey, Jean-Luc, if you knew where the best place to shoot the Borg Cube was, maybe you could have, you know, told someone else about it at some point in the last six years. I'm sure the rest of the attack fleet would have appreciated it. Especially the crew of that ship. And that one. Anyway, the Borg travel back in time to assimilate Earth in the past when there's less resistance, which isn't futile. I guess that was just Borg propaganda. Man, if you can't even trust genocidal fascist cyborgs, it takes the crew of the Enterprise the whole movie to defeat the Borg this time, and the Borg almost succeed. Once again, they're the ultimate threat. That's good. But they also have a queen now. The queen is retconned as having always been a part of the Collective. She was even there at Picard's assimilation. 
She's not a bad villain, actually, and having a single character to represent the Borg threat makes sense dramatically because it gives Picard and Data a foil, a physical adversary to contend with. The Queen works fine for first contact. I mean, yes, she does allow the screenwriters to fall back on the you have to kill the head vampire trope. Once Picard and Data destroy the Queen, the rest of the Borg who have taken over the Enterprise start throwing sparks and dropping dead, which is a lazy plot contrivance, but it happens right at the end of a pretty good movie, so I'm not bothered by it. Sure, the unstoppable collective made up of billions of Borg thinking and acting with a single will was diluted by the introduction of the Queen, and sure, the Queen was also established as the Borg's glaring weak spot, something they never had before, but if First Contact had been the last time we ever saw the Borg, it would have been no problem. It wasn't going to be the last time we ever saw the Borg, though, was it? And you have to think, the producers of the film must have realized that at the time. So does that mean First Contact actually ruined the Borg? Or was it this final suspect. To their credit, the producers of Voyager did hold back on introducing the Borg to their series until the third season, and the first episode to feature the Borg, Unity, is pretty good. As in TNG's Descent, the Voyager crew encounters Borg that have been damaged or disconnected from the Collective, which allows the creators to tell a story involving Borg without needing to further water down the threat of the Borg by having Voyager face and defeat a Borg cube at full strength. Even better, Unity finds something new to say about the Borg, suggesting that their amoral ruthlessness might be the inevitable result of an entire society plugging into a hive mind even if the collective is established with the best of intentions. Unfortunately, it's all downhill from there. The Borg appear in almost two dozen episodes of Voyager, and by my reckoning are prominently featured in about ten. As a point of comparison, the Borg only appear in six episodes of TNG, plus the film First Contact. With every appearance on Voyager, the Borg grow less and less intimidating. The process of reducing the Borg to just another group of hostile aliens kicks off in Scorpion, the two-parter that bridges Voyager's third and fourth seasons, which is the first time we see Captain Janeway and her crew confronted by the Borg Collective proper. One of the things that made the Borg so scary as they were originally conceived was that they couldn't be negotiated with. Remember their first appearance in the TNG episode Q-Who? Guinan, whose people were all but wiped out by the Borg, meets with the senior staff, and Picard's like, so what's the deal with these Borg? How do we reason with them? And Guinan's like, uh, the same way a seal reasons with a great white shark? What does that- It means you don't. That's the point I'm making. They just eat you. You don't reason with them. So we're like, the seal? Later in that episode, Q backs up Guinan's opinion. The Borg don't play by the rules of other species, he tells Picard. All they're interested in is consuming things they've identified as beneficial to them. There's no room for negotiation. They offer no terms other than your total surrender. They're truly alien, unlike anyone else our heroes have had to face, and that makes them formidable and frightening. So what happens when Voyager comes face to face with the Borg Collective for the first time? Janeway transports aboard a cube and strikes a deal with the Borg within a few minutes. Oh, so I guess they can be negotiated with after all. Captain, how the hell were you able to make a deal with the Borg? Because I'm the shark. And yeah, I know Janeway's deal with the Borg is justified by the Borg needing help in their conflict with Species 8472, but the problem isn't that Janeway makes a deal with the Borg that is unjustified within the story. The problem is that the producers of Voyager chose to tell a story where anyone makes a deal with the Borg for any reason. It undermines one of their defining traits. Sure, you could construct a story where it makes sense for the Borg to strike a deal with a Starfleet ship, but why the hell would you want to? That's not all Voyager did. The show also brought back the Borg Queen and wrote her not as the embodiment of an unfathomably vast collective consciousness, but like any old human supervillain. She watches things happen on screens. She has malfunctioning or disobedient Borg brought to her in her 
I don't know, throne room, whatever it is. Why would any of that be necessary? Shouldn't she be able to see and hear and read the thoughts of any Borg drone anywhere on her ship? Hell, anywhere in the galaxy? The worst thing Voyager did to the Borg was to overexpose them. They just used them too much. They went from being something special to part of the show's routine. Voyager would encounter a Borg cube, or sometimes a bunch of Borg cubes, and they'd always escape somehow. The Borg went from being the most powerful existential threat ever faced by the Federation to typical villains of the week who couldn't even destroy one ship. And it kinda took the shine off them. That's the inevitable tragedy that befalls all unbeatable villains, however compelling they are, and the Borg were unquestioningly among the most compelling and original villains ever created for Star Trek at one point. The more you use them, the less effective they are. The heroes defeating an enemy that just took out half of Starfleet with one ship might work great once or twice, but that's about it. The more you show the unstoppable bad guys being outsmarted or outright defeated by the good guys, the more stoppable they start to appear. Look, from a commercial standpoint, I get it. They're the Borg. Put them in a show and Trekkies are gonna watch. Especially if it's 1996, 1997, and they were just the featured bad guys in a movie that pretty much everybody liked. But the fact that the producers of Voyager felt they had to lean so heavily on the Borg to get people to watch the final few seasons of their show really speaks to their failure to create compelling antagonists of their own, don't you think? <sighs> I'm getting off topic. Bottom line, the Borg went from being an adversary so unstoppable that Captain Picard had to beg Q for help in order to escape them, to cookie-cutter villains of the week who were no more difficult for the crew of the starship Voyager to defeat than, I don't know, the Vidians. Okay, maybe not that easy, but pretty easy. And what I'm asking you is, who's responsible? You witnessed the whole thing. We just went over it. So you tell me. Was it... TNG? First Contact? Or Voyager? Who actually ruined the Borg? Who actually ruined the Borg? Hey. Hey. <laughs> Come on. You know what I want to hear, right? Just tell me the truth. Just tell me who ruined the Borg. All right, you know, I must be a little mixed up because I thought we were gonna help each other out. I do right by you, you do right by me. But that doesn't seem to be the case, now does it? So my witness you turned out to be. You know what, just get lost, get out of here. Hey, keep your nose clean. Don't give me a reason to bring you back in here. Under different circumstances, you might not find me to be so hospitable. Understood? All right, let's scram. This concludes our interview. Hey, that was fun, right? Something a little different? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I'm going to let you know what the topic of the next Trek Actually video is in just a moment. But first, I want to give shout outs to my newest $5 plus Patreon patrons. And those fine folks would be Chris Cox. Thank you, Chris. Stephen Scott Gerritsen. Thank you, Stephen. Vaughn Lauren. Thank you, Vaughn. Joshua Weinbarger. Thank you, Joshua. And Huge Nut. Thank you, Huge. Thanks to all of you. If you enjoy these Trek Actually videos that I make, or any of the other videos that I do on this channel, the Facebook 5, Steven Stuffy, whatever they are, and you can afford it and you think I'm worth it and you want to help me to continue making those videos, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives and becoming a patron. You can become a patron for as little as $1 a month, but if you pledge $5 a month or more, you get some extra perks, including having your name shouted out at the end of a Trek Actually video just like I just did right there. I also want to remind you, 
especially if you like the Star Trek stuff that I do, that I co-host a Star Trek themed comedy podcast called The Ensign's Log, where myself and the brilliantly funny Jason Harding play characters. We portray uh, low ranking sort of junior officers aboard a certain famous Federation starship that is taking part in a certain famous legendary five-year mission. I think you can connect the dots from there. And it's a lot of fun. We've really enjoyed it. We've really enjoyed the feedback from those of you who have listened so far. And if you like Star Trek and you like funny sort of takes on Star Trek or spoofs or satires on Star Trek, you should check out The Ensign's Log. You can subscribe via RSS or you can listen on SoundCloud or listen through their website. The links are in the description of this video. So please, if you haven't checked it out yet and you enjoy the Star Trek themed stuff that I do in my videos, check out The Ensign's Log podcast. I think you'll really dig it. And uh, that's it for this episode of Trek Actually. For the next episode of Trek Actually, I'm going to turn to one of the most beloved characters in all of Star Trek and someone that a lot of people are talking about at the moment because it was just announced that he will be the focus of a brand new Star Trek series coming up in the near future. I am, of course, talking about the one and only Jean-Luc Picard. He will be the focus of the next episode of Trek Actually. I can't wait for that one. It's going to be a lot of fun. I love me some Captain Picard. Hopefully you do too. And I'll see you next time.